This week's lecture, we're calling it Clean Energy Technologies, but it should probably really be cleaner. So nothing is really clean, clean. It's just a relative term. So last week, as a reminder, we were looking at renewable energy, what was renewable versus non-renewable. And in the discussion group, somebody asked, what happens if we, have, if we had to burn plastic? Is burning plastic a form of renewable energy? And while it's probably not, well, I don't know if it's the right answer or not the right answer, I would call the burning of plastic alternative energy. So it's not necessarily renewable because ultimately we don't want plastic to be polluting the world anyway. And yes, plastic is useful and we will never get rid of plastic, but in an ideal world, we don't really want to have plastic polluting the world. So I would call that a alternative energy, I would I suppose. Today we're going to look at cleaner energies. Cleaner energies can be non-renewable, so they're not there. We're going to go back to coal again, but it's ways on how we can make these non-renewable energies cleaner and more safe, or not safe, but, but better for the environment. There is going to be a little bit of repetition in this, this week's slides, so please feel free to just flick through backwards and forwards as you, as you feel, feel fit for what you need to know or not. The other thing about this week's slides, and probably last week's slides as well, is that Wikipedia is actually your friend. You're not going to hear this in many of your courses, um, and it's not going to be recommended, but I do recommend for this section to just go to Wikipedia or just Google quickly some of the terms that are used in this one here. There's some nice articles on Wikipedia about some of the technologies and some of the ideas that, that we're going to look through today. So please do use Wikipedia for this week's lesson as a supplementary aid to these slides. So the objectives for this week's lectures are to basically understand the need for clean energy. Why do we actually want to do this? What are some different clean energy technologies that are applicable? And this is not to South Africa and only South Africa, rather, it's to everywhere. And also just to gain some knowledge and some implementation strategies. What are the key, what are the pros and cons of some of this thing so that we can reduce air pollution in particular? So this is a slide that we've probably had before or we've seen before from last week, just in terms of what exactly is our, sorry, let me just get a pointer going. Uh, sorry, there we go. So what exactly is our energy requirements? As we said before, we have low energy demand in the 1980s. As we get into the future, the energy demand is going to increase. Last week, we said that oil and coal and gas were our non-renewables. I think that's the only ones, or nuclear as well. And we're now going to start having renewables, so the biomass, hydro, and other renewables, you can see here in the 2030s, these numbers get big, whereas previously they were almost non-existent to us as now power mix. So the same thing here, renewables and energy, sorry, renewables and nuclear power are going to increase between 2006 and 2030. So sorry, this is a bit out of focus, but you can see there that the coal as a total of our requirements is going to shrink down to 21%. This is globally. The same thing with some of the other non-renewables gas from 20 to 18. But then the renewables, as we said in the bottom here, we have some renewables at the top, which is going from 18% in total all the way up to 40% when we include wind, hydro, biomass, and sorry, not the nuclear, but nuclear does increase as well. Okay, so just the renewables increasing from 18 to 40, the nuclear from 15 to 18%. Okay, so as you said, I'm going to be repeating some of the stuff from last week, but we've got here the global supply and demand for petroleum. In 2009, the demand for oil was roughly 84 million barrels per day. In the US alone, it was 18.69. The production, you can see there again, there's the global production, which is slightly higher than the demand because we have some surplus. The US is producing a lot, but more importantly, the Persian Gulf is producing 2.89. The OPEC countries, those the oil producing companies, are up to 33.88 million barrels per day. So that's million barrels per day. That's a lot of oil that was being produced. In terms of renewable energy, though, again, we have from 2007 to 2015. Sorry, I don't know why there's suddenly, okay, sorry, the E's are for estimates. The blue, the hydropower, is expected to stay fairly, fairly flat. Wind increase, there's a slight wobble in that one. Solar, it is still increasing. There are no or very little CO2 emissions on this one. The CO2 emissions and what we are wanting to worry about today is going to come from the oil, the gas, and the coal. Before we move on, we're just going to quickly look at two different concepts here. It's the energy intensity versus the energy efficiency. So we'll start with that second one, the energy efficiency. So this is defined for a component or a service, 
as the amount of energy that's required in the production of that service. So let's just say for amount of steel. So it's the amount of steel that can be produced with one and a certain amount of energy. So how much of a product are we going to get for a kilojoule of energy? So obviously the more product we get per energy, the more efficient it is in terms of energy efficiency. So obviously if we're looking at that ratio then, it's going to be proved that either the service is provided with less energy or you get more amount of product per energy input. So again, it's sort of how much product do we get per energy that we are putting in. So we are trying to reduce the amount of pollution or carbon that is emitted. So we want to reduce the amount of energy for the same amount of product. The next one is energy intensity. So energy intensity is the amount of energy that's used in producing a given level of output or activity. So it is measured by the quantity of energy required to perform a particular activity. And this one is expressed as energy per unit of output. So it's effectively the inverse of the previous one. How much energy do you need to put in for that product that you're looking at in, that, in whatever example you are working with? So in terms of the energy efficiency, we're going to have a demand side response. So the demand is how much do we want of this energy? So we want the cheapest, cleanest, and most rapidly expandable option but often the lack of the knowledge limits the diffusion of that. So if we are wanting more energy, more energy is easiest to come by by something that is cheap, clean, and quickly expandable. So how can you get more of this? So large power plants are often difficult to do because there's one big power plant. If we want to build a new Madupi, it's not gonna happen in five seconds. It's gonna happen over many years, okay? So if we're looking at the IE's greenest energy proje projection, energy efficiency can account for two thirds of averted emissions. So if we can improve or we get greener options, we can then avert some of these emissions that we are looking at. Many of the profitable measures that currently exist could earn average returns of between 10 and 17%. Okay, so that's the amount of the benefit, at least, that we would get from these type of things. The potential concern from the demand side, so that's, again, we're looking at the demand side. I want more. The potential concern for that rebound effect that higher efficiency makes using energy cheaper. So if I suddenly demand, I want more energy for either my personal capacity or I've got a big business, steel manufacturer or something like that, I'm asking the energy producer to make more. If they're making more, they can either make the energy more efficient or they can make it make more of it. It often becomes cheaper. If I have cheaper energy, I'm probably going to use more of it because it's, there's no point in me saving energy now because it's coming to me cheaper. I can just not worry about my energy efficiency. Okay, so therefore, the demand is then going to even increase even more. Okay, so the example that we've got on here is that if suddenly the petrol price drops by half, so sorry, I'm using the word gasoline here. I should have used the word petrol. It was copied from a previous year's slide from one of your previous lecturers. So if the pr pe price of petrol suddenly halves, does that mean we're going to drive the same distance or are we now going to decide, hang on, instead of going for lunch to somewhere close by, I can now drive to Pretoria and go and find a nice new restaurant there because it's cheaper. Or I don't have to worry about moving closer to my work because petrol is now cheaper. I can drive the same distance or I can even drive further. Okay. So this rebound effect in two British studies, they suggested that it can cancel out as much as a quarter or even more a third of the gains from any sort of energy efficiency that the producers make when we demand more energy. So further on with the energy, sorry, the energy efficiency on the demand side. So with some investments, the energy intensity in the US has been falling by 2% per year. So this number might be slightly outdated. We just need to double check that again. Globally, the energy efficiency is by one, sorry, I think that should be 1.5%. That should be, I think that's 1.5% globally. I'll change that on the slides that I hand out to you. So 1.5% globally per year. Again, I've just given you an indication or a redefinition of the energy intensity in terms of a nation and not of a product. Please remember that you have the opportunity to pause these videos at any time if I'm speaking too quickly so that you can read through this and go through things that I might, you think I might have missed because they're already in the text. In terms of what's happening on the energy efficiency on the demand side response, this graph here looks at the global greenhouse gas abatement cost curve beyond 2030. So for each of these instances here, you can see there's a light lighting switch and incandescent to LED residential. What exactly is the cost 
on this. Sorry, so the abatement potential here per year. So if we look at this on the very left, there is a poor potential. So things on the left have a poor potential of major improvements. So this is on a national or a global scale. So if I change my lighting from an incandescent to LED residential bulb, it's not going to change. Me changing my little bulbs in all of my houses, in all of our houses, is not going to have a big effect according to the x-axis. It's not going to have a large impact. However, if we look at the very right-hand side, if we decide to change the whole gas plant, so we change an iron and steel facility, we put a new facility and we change the technology, we add new CCS, it's going to be carbon capture and storage, we'll get to that later. If we put in new technology, the whole entire ESKIM gets replaced. You'll see that there's a large potential for a change to the environmental abatement. So that's the global, sorry, gigatons of carbon dioxide emitted per year. However, when we look on the y-axis, what is the actual cost for us to do that? So on the left, where it was having very minimal impact, it's obviously going to be fairly cheap. As we go to the right, it's actually going to be more and more expensive. So you'll see, and please again pause this so you can read through this yourself. So if we change residential items, residential appliances, HVAC systems, that's heating, ventilation, air conditioning, or if we change our cars to fully hybrid, you'll see the car, car value is still more expensive than a light, changing a light bulb, but it's less expensive than changing an entire ESCOM facility. Okay. So in South Africa, we're going to come back to South Africa. We have a situation where coal is the predominant form of energy. So most of our energy is coming from coal. We either burn it directly in our Eskom fired power plants. So that's going to be in the Mpumalanga area, the Whitbank coal fields, as well as up now Madupi and Kusile. We either fire it directly or we use our coal to transform it into liquid fuels through Sassel. So coal, I think I said this last week as well, is very important to South Africa. The problem with that is that coal has very high CO2 emissions. It also has some other pollutants, but we're going to worry about CO2 on this slide. So as I say, it's, it's vital for South Africa, and in worldwide, it's, it will be on the increase in the medium term. So it's not something that's going to disappear completely until we have fixed our renewable resources. So we have to do something with it. As I say already, it's a 90% energy supply, and that 21% is from the Sassel. It is also a big earner from us. So not only do we mine our coal and then burn it or transform it into liquid fuels, but we also sell it. So the Chinese, I know, take quite a lot of our coal, and I'm not sure there are probably other countries that you can think of that probably take a lot of our coal. According to this slide, it's either our first or second largest commodity, depending on the year and the demand. Okay. So the Vitbank supply that I've already mentioned will probably peak this decade. I think this decade was last decade, so I'm not 100% sure when that will peak. And then the Kusile and the Mudupi areas in the Limpopo and water bag are going to be the future for our coal. Because we have such a large dependence on coal, the bad news is that South Africa is the 13th largest CO2 emitter globally. So if you try and think of countries that are bigger than us, you can find 13 countries very quickly. So USA, Canada, Brazil, India, Russia, China, there are not that many countries, sorry, there are a lot of countries that are bigger than us, yet we are the 13th greatest CO2 emitter globally. We are producing 440 megatons annually. Megaton annual, sorry, that number, I need to just double check, please check on your slides, if your slides you've got, if I've changed that number or not. Sorry, let me go back again. 440 megaton annual emissions, when this slide was done, and I haven't been able to find numbers to update this yet, unfortunately. So that was in 2016-17, I think, when the slide was done. The estimated then increase would be up to 550 megatons of CO2 emissions by 2020. So we just need to double check those numbers. Of those numbers, Eskom, of those 440, Eskom is producing, that's about half of that per annum. Sassel is then contributing 75 megatons, which equals three quarters of the total emissions in South Africa. Okay. In terms of the CO2 emissions, China is first, USA is second. But the bad thing is China and the USA are very big countries. The population of China is, what's it, in the billions probably. USA is 330 million upwards. So the population of, chi of, those, of China and USA is a lot bigger than South Africa. So when we look at our high emissions, our 13th greatest CO2 emitter, that's just an absolute value. When we take into account our population, the emission intensity on this is even worse. 
okay, both in terms of our GDP numbers, the GDP definition was given a few slides back, and in terms of our population numbers. So the first way for South Africa to reduce our CO2 emission numbers is by changing the energy mix. So instead of relying on coal, which is a large environmental burden, we can change the energy mix. So the prediction, and I'm not sure when this came, comes from, that the energy mix by 2030 would move more to nuclear. So 27% nuclear, 27 renewable, as well as 27 supercritical and IGCC. So this supercritical and IGC is the, I'll come back to the IGCC because it has multiple multiple names with acronyms, so I'm going to get the, the, the things wrong if I just think of it now. This is still a coal issue, so we're still using coal for this 27%, but it is a cleaner form of coal, and that's what we want to actually focus on today. So we are never going to get rid of this coal, so we've said that before, the non-renewables, but how can we make this cleaner? And that's what the supercritical IGCC will be. We still reduce it by changing to nuclear and renewable, but we also have clean energy now with this coal. So that is going to be done in several ways. We can either clean the coal process, let's try and burn the coal more efficiently so we don't have CO2 coming out, find a different way of burning the CO2, or if we do have the CO2, how are we going to capture it or reduce it or what are we going to do? And that's what the supercritical IGCC is going to, going to involve. So this clean coal technology, we need to first understand how exactly do we burn our, or how, not us, but how can you burn coal? What are the different ways of doing it? So typically, a coal-fired power plant can burn in different ways. The typical way is just, and you'll see in various notes, it's just called PF. So previous notes and previous tuts and things are going to refer to PF, which is normally as a small PF for some reason, is pulverized fuel. So take the coal out of the ground, crash it up into little small pieces, and just burn it like that. The other way is to look at supercritical firing of the coal, or ultra-supercritical firing of the coal to get our energy. The second one is looking at fluidized bed combustion, and I'm adding all of these acronyms here, or these shortenings, these abbreviations, these FBC, CFBC, because again, you'll see a lot of notes where they are going to start using these, these letters a lot. Okay, we'll come back to fluidized bed on the next slide. Internal or integrated gasification combined cycle, so this is the IGCC technology. So you're going to hear a lot about different ways of reducing carbon dioxide emissions, this is one of the key ways of doing it. So it's the internal gasification combined cycle. I've seen some notes that call it the integrated. So integrated or internal, please just check. I don't know which one is more common. I think it's actually the integrated, but the two words are used interchangeably. 99% of people are just going to talk about IGCC though. The other way to have a clean coal technology is if we can take the CO2 that's being emitted from the coal and do something with it, take it out of the system. So one of those options is an underground coal gasification system, a UCG, and as well, we'll get to that and discuss that in future slides. So just coming back to the, that list that we had now, so I said the pulverized coal, that is the conventional type of steel power plant. We take the oh, of coal-fired power plant, take the coal, crush it up. We're going to operate at steam pressure, and of roughly 170 bar. It is subcritical power plant, and most stations globally are running like this. Okay, so this is the typical power plant. If you look at a power plant, coal-fired power plant, 99% of the time, it is this. The more modern ones are to be supercritical plants. So these are going to operate at, not get, operate at higher pressures. These are greater than the critical pressure, and the critical pressure in this instance will be 230 to 265 bar. So you can see it's another 60 bar above the pulverized fuel option. So because we're now operating at a critical pressure, it's going to be a high temperature and pressure system. These higher temperatures and pressures are going to increase the efficiency. So these are examples of these rather are Cassili and Madupi. If you have higher efficiencies, you're going to get more energy out per kilogram of coal. So if you're going to get more kilograms, sorry, more kilojoules out of a piece of coal than you were before, you're still going to get the same amount of CO2 emissions, but now when we look at it in terms of CO2 emissions per energy unit that we are getting, it's now relatively reduced. The third one on this is a next generation power plant. So I don't think South Africa has, I don't know if plans of South, for South Africa to do this, but this is now taking up the supercritical from 265 bar from the previous one, and we're going to ramp it all up to 300, and the temperatures in this one are going to go up to 615 to 630. So the same way we had greater efficiencies 
in supercritical, we have even better efficiencies in the ultra supercritical. It will have its downsides, obviously, with pressures that are as high as 300 bar and temperatures as high as this. You need to be able to get your system up to that sort of temperature and pressure in the first place, which will have its own engineering challenges to start with. So importance here, we've already mentioned energy intensity, but another important concept, and you should have seen this somewhere either in thermodynamics or in energy balances, maybe even in first year, is to remember the concept of the heating value. So the heating value, or it's the value, the, the amount of energy that you can get out of a fuel, is, is the, sorry, as I say, it's the heat released during the combustion of a specific amount of that fuel. So the higher heating value, you can calculate as the lower heating value plus the heat of vaporization, multiplied by X, or the fraction of moles, the number of moles of hydrogen divided by the number of moles of fuel. I'm not going to ask you to calculate the higher heating value or the lower heating value in this course, but just to remember, you'll see elsewhere, and just to re reflect back that it's important here as well, that if we can increase the higher heating value of a fuel, we are going to be increasing the efficiency, so you're not going to have as much CO2 coming off your system, so therefore it's effectively more environmentally friendly per of the fuel that you have burnt. Okay, so just have a look at these. You can see there's the subcritical, supercritical, and ultra supercritical, and how these values drop. So it's the grams of CO2 that is released per kilowatt hour or the energy that is coming out of this by the efficiency there of the higher heating value. The second way of looking at coal fired power station was through the fluidized bed combustor. So this is the, flu the FBC. So what we have is that we have suspended solids that are moving upwards by jets. So you can see here, we have the combustor chamber. So we feed our fuel in, I'm trying to see where do we, we put air in the side here, sorry. We put our, so don't think of this necessarily as sewage sludge, we put our fuel, so we put our fuel in through the side here, this hopper. So this is just an example, we can, we can use this system for things other than coal as well. So we feed our coal in here, it comes into the bottom of this bed, push the air in here, and when this air blows up, you're going to get a fluidized bed. So I know that some of you, I don't know if it's all of you, are going to be looking at fluidized beds in third year. Some of you might look at it in third year, depending on the ChemMed curriculum at the time. So this is just a fluidized bed system, as you've seen in solid fluids or in mass transfer systems in the past. The difference here is that you're not just having a fluidized bed, you're also going to be having things burning. So the air pushes up through here, this bed becomes fluidized, it can then burn. The gases can then come out, so you can either get some flue gas, incinerated ash coming out the top, or we can then get a cyclone system here, so you can have a recycled, um, I'm just gonna see, sometimes they call it a recycled, they add the word recycled onto this here. Okay, so anything that isn't burnt, the solid that isn't burnt, gets back in there into this loop, so that you have a recycle of the of the coal or the fuel that isn't being burnt. Okay, auxiliary feeds might just be for not necessarily the coal system if you want to have different gases coming in or different reactants. So as I said, this diagram is not necessarily just for coal, it could be for other fuels as well. So you might have something there that you want to add, some additional fuel that you want to get this thing going in the first place. Okay, so this I'll let you read through here on how, how this will then work and other nuances of that system. So this, as I said, this is the circulating fluidized bed. That's the diagram that I had before. That's, sorry, I was looking, this is what I was, the word I was looking for, not recycled, it was called circulating. So the circulated fluidized bed, that's what we had the diagram of before. That has the potential to improve the operational characteris characteris characteristics sorry, by using higher air flows. So if you have the higher air flows, you can get this stuff going a little bit faster. We get high volumes going through here. The hot cyclone separators can separate out the fuel from the gases that you've burnt off, getting the heat off here so you can get that fuel back into the system to reburn it. These are relatively clean gases. So, sorry, these are relatively clean gases, yes. Those clean gases would then go onto a heat exchange where they can get cooled, they can get heated. You typically heat that up to a steam and steam can then turn turbines, okay. This approach has a theoretically simplified design, but you can extend this into more complex systems. So I can't switch back now, but I have seen diagrams as well. So when you 
Google this when you check on Wikipedia, like I suggested at the start, you will see that there are some more advanced systems. So there's a double double circulation or a an, an extra feedback system. Okay, so you can actually improve this depending on exactly how you're setting this up. So here you can see a little bit about what I say. You can start expanding this process and coming up with different design processes. So here in the middle in the green, we have the circulating fluidized bed furnace. So our coal comes in here. Don't worry too much about anything else. The coal comes in here. We burn the coal, which then has the cyclone, which can return the circulate, oh, sorry, any solids that aren't burnt. The gases can come through out at the top here. There can be a second, so there can be boiler feed water in here. So you can get some type of energy production through this blue system. But more importantly, here at the top here, we have a boiler. So we can have water coming through here that will get heated by this fluidized, sorry, the, yes, sorry, yes, the, circ, the fluidized bed furnace. Water gets heated here, which then goes out to create the steam. You can then do the steam to turn turbines, do whatever you want on this. So you see you can have multiple sections, and that's how you increase the efficiency. The electric precipitation, we might want to precipitate things out for the ash. There might be fans, and then obviously the stack. Ultimately, the flue gas, the CO2, has to escape somewhere, somehow. The next one that we can look at is going to be the integrated gasification combined cycle. So now I've just called it the integrated. So this IGCC. The IGCC is actually a combination of two technologies. The first is coal gasification. So that is going to use coal to create a clean burning gas. So it's going to be a syngas. We're going to try and get the best possible use out of that coal. And then the second half of this process is going to be the combined cycle where we are going to get the electricity. So we're going to gasify. So that bullet point at the bottom, we're going to gasify coal. And again, I see another typo here. Sorry about that. That should be ore. So it's a gasification of coal or biomass or anything else that will burn. We're then going to clean that gas and we're going to combust the gas in a turbine generator to produce electricity. So those are the two steps in the IGCC. So if we look at these two different steps, the gasification and the combined cycle, so we say the gasification portion is going to produce that clean syngas, which is going to fuel the combustion turbine, which will be the second part. So what happens is that coal is combined with oxygen. It can either be straight oxygen or it can be air. It can also be oxygen enriched air. So it also works with those, although oxygen is actually the preferred route. In that gasifier, we're just going to produce a gaseous fuel. That is going to be hydrogen and carbon monoxide. So you end up with a fuel mixture from coal. So whatever the coal consistency is, you're going to get hydrogen and carbon monoxide as your desired products. It will also have byproducts, so you might get some tars and other things. But that gas, as I said, the hydrogen and carbon monoxide is what you want. That is then going to be cleaned up by a gas cleanup process. So depending on what is in the coal, you're probably going to get some nitrous oxide, some sulfur, some other things which you don't want. So that's what the cleanup process is doing. And then once it's cleaned, you're going to go into the combustion turbine to produce electricity. This is now what the second part is, the combined cycle. So that clean gas is going to go into a combustion turbine or generator, and it's also going to include a heat recovery stream generator, as well as a steam turbine generator. So we can have various different systems on this, but ultimately the exhaust heat from that combustion turbine can be recovered in a heat recovery system so that you are reusing some of your heat. You don't want to lose any heat. The whole point of this is to generate heat so that you can either turn a turbine or so that you can produce steam and that steam is then going to power the turbine or other generators and things like that, which is going to produce electricity. This combined cycle is more efficient because it's going to reuse any waste heat. So you're trying in this system not to waste any heat. If we look at a very basic diagram of this, so I'm trying to see how this looks as we go around. So this part one here, this is where we are going to be gasifying it. So we've got water coming in that you are going to be able to heat. But on the left here, we've got the, sorry, working up after the water, we've got the coal that is going to be entered into this gasifier with the oxygen. And this here is where we have that gasifier to produce the hydrogen and the carbon monoxide. This then flows out. So there we have our syngas. As I said, we are going to have some cleaning happening. We want to take out those components that we don't want. And then in step two, we are going to burn these 
in a combustor. From this burnt, from this burning system, we can then have the expansion of the gases, and then three, that hot gas drives gas turbines. So it's actually hot gas that's going to drive those turbines, which then make electricity. Those hot gases have cooled down a bit, or they are going to flow through there. They are still hot. Those hot water, sorry, those hot gases are going to heat water in point four. So that, sorry, it says here cooling gas, it's still hotter than water. So that as it comes through the first turbine, it has cooled a little bit, but it's still hotter than the water, which can then heat up the water. Sorry, it's going around the top. That steam that it's now produced is going to turn its own turbine in a steam generator here. We then condense that in a condenser to bring it back as water, which then gets reheated and circulated. So there's the second section where we have electricity. So as we say, why is this different? It now has two portions of where we could possibly have energy being produced. The other side of this is that the syngas, this carbon monoxide and hydrogen, yeah, carbon monoxide and hydrogen is cleaner than sending out or venting out carbon dioxide to the environment. It can get more complicated than this, and I'm not going to spend any time going through all of this system, but please have a look at this and see how, how this would look in a more realistic point. The previous diagram was a simplified version. This is a little bit more advanced on how you would see it in industry when you go out working one day. So why do we want this IGCC? We've already said it has higher efficiencies and lower emissions than combustion alone. We also have that double system we've already said. So there's two opportunities to actually get energy out of the system. The improvements in the efficiency not only reduce the emissions from carbon combustion, but that increase in efficiency can be between 35 and 40% Sorry, on the energy efficiency through that system. It's also, for example, can reduce the CO2 by more than CO2 emissions by over 10% because of this different type of, or the different use rather of coal in converting it to energy. Efficiencies are currently approaching 50%, sorry, yes, 55%. So IGCC power plants can use less coal and produce lower CO2 emissions to give us the same amount of energy. There is also more product flexibility in terms of this. So we can also include carbon capture and storage. And we've also said that we've got hydrogen production. So if we have hydrogen production, that's another way that we could actually get further energy. I'm just trying to see it. You can read through this on your own. But the other important one I want to just highlight here is that CO2 can be captured from the coal syn gas. So this is one that we are going to look at when we get to some of our things later on. So just remember, CO2 can be captured from this process. The next one that we had on our system, we had something about underground coal gasification. So I'm going to start with a diagram here and just talk to it, and I'll ask you to read, read through the words when you've paused this afterwards. So underground coal gasification is an idea where we have coal underground. So this is this black section here. This is the coal seam. So the green section here is where we are standing. So that is the, the surface of the earth. And what we are going to do is we're going to drill two holes. We're going to drill an injection well down on the right hand side here and off to the left. And then we are going to have a gas cleanup on the right. So from this injection well, and maybe I should just double check here. Uh, we are going to now burn the coal. We're going to gasify this coal while it's still underground. So the idea is, in theory, is that we are not going to pull up the coal from underground and then do whatever we want with it on the surface. We are going to do something with it underground. So in this instance, we are going to gasify it. So that means that we are going to heat it to temperatures that would potentially cause it to burn. But if we are going to carefully regulate the flow, the coal does not burn but separates into syngas. So we're not going to burn it to combustion. We are going to regulate it so that we can produce syngas in the same way as we had in the previous example. So that is hydrogen and carbon monoxide. That gasification underground, that underground gasification system, we can then have our second system where we can pull up that syngas and we can then use our syngas at the top for however we want to, to use it. So we again, we don't have to worry about digging up the coal. We don't have to pulverize and burns through supercritical or critical systems on the top. 
We do everything that we want to underground through careful regulation of temperatures and flows so that we just get the gases that we want coming up to the surface. So these gases that come to the surface, these products are going to be hydrogen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, and sulfur. Sorry, another typo today. This mix will vary on what the coal type is. So some coals will have more sulfur than others. Others, depending on the, the flow of air, oxygen, or the oxygen-enriched air, and the reactor conditions, these are the underground conditions, this product mix will be different. Okay. This all depends on the chemical and power requirements and we can change and the changing hydrogen content, which is typically between 14 and 18% hydrogen. The limitations of this is that it is out of sight. So this could be both a good and a bad thing. What is happening out of sight? We don't know what's happening out of sight. We don't have, we have less control of something that is underground that we can't see. But from a environmental point of view or a aesthetic point of view, you don't have the big open hole that you have in other open pit coal producing sites. So you don't have that environmental impact of the big hole. There are a limited number of parameters that are controlled, so it needs to be carefully monitored. The airflow that's going in, the size of the hole, the, te the temperatures, things like that, you have very limited number of parameters that can control. It's also difficult, where do you put the site selection? So a coal, underground coal system could be fairly large. Where's the coal? So you need to have a very good understanding of the geological layout and how to actually get this, get this done. There are environmental issues of what happens underground, how do we control this, and well, finally, who actually, who actually does this? There's not many skills, skilled people who have actually done this before, um, because if you look at the bottom here, we've had many trials, but there's no commercial operations. So getting this right still takes, still may take, or well, once we get it right, where do we get the skills to do this sort of thing? Okay, but there are some advantages, so it's not all bad news. The good thing is that there's less dust and visual impact. So I've already said that if you have an open pit mine, there's a large visual impact. This method also uses less water, and there's, as such, there's less risk for surface water pollution. So you're not using the water to clean the coal, to do various other things, so you're not going to be polluting the water. Also, still some methane that is going to be emitted, but in this method, there are, there's going to be less methane. The big thing, which is nice for workers and people living in the area, is that there's no dirt handling on site, so you're not going to have lots of dust particles and dirt floating around around the site. And in the same way, you've got no ash that is produced, so you don't need to worry about that disposal on site. As you've also realized, a lot of our load shedding in South Africa, Eskom tells us that the coal got wet, so they can't do things. That coal gets wet because there's often a lot of coal that is being stockpiled and then they don't have anywhere to keep it so it gets rained on and it gets wet. In this gasification or this underground gasification system, you don't need to have that problem or you won't have that problem because you don't stockpile the gas, sorry, the coal. It's all underground. It's also going to have a smaller surface footprint so you don't have to have as much land up on the surface when you do this type of process. Okay, so just looking at, and maybe the slide should have come last week or earlier on in the in this thing, maybe I'll change it around for next time. The CO2 emissions, if we look at the CO2 emissions by fuel. So in terms of the fuel, we have coal. So I think I've mentioned this before, our world in data is a fabulous place to go and look around at various different um, data sets. It also has up to date by the, sometimes by the day, things like COVID data, it's got it by the hour almost. So our world in data, so this is up to 2019. The data for what are the global, so the global emissions of CO2 by fuel. So as we already said, the coal is a big emitter. It's come down in the recent times, probably because coal is not being used in certain areas. But you can see it is the biggest emitter of CO2. So it's been the biggest emitter for quite a long time. Oil jumped over a bit, so oil is still quite high and gas as it's become more popular is being emitted. So this is why we are actually looking at coal. So that's why I say this slide should have been put quite a, quite a while ago. So coal, this is why we want to actually reduce the amount of CO2 being emitted from coal. But when we talk about CO2 emissions, how much is, I'm sorry, again, I can't go through, through what that is. When we talk about one ton of CO2 emissions, one ton of CO2 emissions means very little to me. So if we try and relate this more to, and sorry about this is this has to be a 
suburban street because that's what the diagram was that I found. There's the link at the bottom. There's some other examples that you can go and see. One ton of CO2 emissions is equivalent to a cube that is 8.13 meters high. So obviously 8.31 meters high by length by breadth as well. So that's how much one point, sorry, one ton of carbon dioxide is. So when we talk about daily CO2 emissions, so again, this was the diagram that I had that this link at the bottom has. So Australia's daily greenhouse gas, gas emissions would cover, and that is the Sydney, Sydney Opera House there in the front. So this is obviously Sydney. So Sydney, I don't know how tall those buildings are actually, but that's the volume of CO2 emitted in a day. So we are wanting to look at ways to get rid of that CO2. The CO2 is leading to, and we'll get to this, we're still going to do a, a lecture on both carbon footprinting and life cycle assessment. We want to reduce it. And what exactly does a carbon footprint mean? Global warming, sorry, it leads to global warming or cl climate change. So if we can reduce the amount of CO2 in the environment, that will go a long way to help reduce the climate change issue and global warming. So the term that you're going to come across now that is used in all of this is CO2 sequestration. So how can we take out CO2 from the environment? So this is a family of methods for capturing, and this is important here, it's permanently isolating the gases that would otherwise contribute to global climate change. So it's not a way of taking it out of the atmosphere for one or two days, it's a way of taking it out for many, many years, or permanently rather. Ideally, it's an affordable way of doing it, so we don't want to come up with means that are going to be unaffordable, and it also needs to be environmentally safe. Okay, so if that if we can, uh, can do that, it can be a way to stabilize the atmospheric levels of CO2 without requiring any large-scale or costly changes to the energy infrastructure. So we've already got all of these coal-fired power stations, we've got IGCC, we've got all of these other things that are aiming to reduce CO2 into the atmosphere. But there is going to be a point, and that point is coming fairly soon on some of these technologies, where we can't improve the efficiency anymore. So if we are still emitting CO2, how can we take the CO2 out of the environment? This is not just applicable to the energy industry, but obviously because energy, as we showed in that previous slide, or three or four slides ago, because energy, or sorry, not energy, yes, because energy, because energy production is contributing so much to the CO2 emissions, it is definitely applicable to coal-fired power plants, but it is also applicable to energy, any industry, oil, gas, coal. Sorry, it is applicable to all of them, but we haven't yet implemented it in, on coal. Sorry, that's a long way around for that one bullet point. In terms of CO2 sequestration, though, there are going to be four stages. We want to capture the CO2. Ideally, we want to compress it. So you saw on the previous slide that one ton is as large as somebody's house. In one day, it's the equivalent to the whole of Sydney plus some. So we want to compress it to make it more reasonable and then transport it. That's point two. The third one is we want to store it. And then lastly, we need to have some monitoring in place so that we can actually make sure that wherever we've put the CO2, it doesn't disappear. Okay. It has an enormous potential. It's a matter of implementing it now. It could reduce the CO2 emissions by 80 to 90%. However, that needs to be Sorry, the capturing carbon needs a lot of energy. So particularly in something like energy production, like coal, we're now making more coal, which makes more CO, sorry, we're using more coal to make more energy. That energy and you, by using coal is producing more CO2 when the whole point of this was to reduce CO2. Okay, so luckily for us, we would increase fuel consumption by roughly 10 to 40%. But if we can get, where was the number up here? If we could get, or haven't I come to it yet? Maybe it's on a latest, oh, sorry, I have. If we can reduce by 80 to 90% of the CO2 emissions, obviously there is still benefit in doing this type of process. The problem though, is that with the increased capital cost and a total increased cost of the energy, you could end up having 30 to 60% higher energy in order to do this carbon capture and storage. In some places that's going to lead to serious complaints by citizens in South Africa in particular, I'm sure if we had to suddenly have a 50% increase on top of the regular increases, there are going to be complaints and people might just not be able to afford it. So if we can't afford to pay Eskom more to do a carbon capture and storage or a CS2 sequestration, it may never just be physically possible to do this.
So now the question comes, where exactly or how do we actually store CO2? So capturing it, so there are two diagrams here. So the capturing it is fairly easy in terms of your engineering knowledge or engineering knowledge, we can capture it. So, sorry, let's start on this diagram here rather. CO2 would be discharged somehow. If you've got modern technology, you would actually capture it as it gets emitted. There are actually means now of CO2 capture and then storage while we compress it and then transport it. But the real question now is what do we actually do with this? So if I was in person with you and in previous classes, this now becomes a half hour discussion or a 45 minute discussion of how on earth do you actually do this and how will it work? And there are a whole lot of questions that I'm sure a whole lot of you have. So in theory, and I'm gonna send, I've got you a diagram here, sorry, not a diagram, a link here where this diagram comes from. It's from a Wikipedia or a wiki, sorry, at Dickinson University. Please go and have a look and read on this on some of the issues on carbon capture and storage. As I say, the capture is easy. The compression is easy, that's fine. The transportation, depending on where you want to do it, you can take it out to the sea, but now where do we put it? There are several options. One is to pump this down, you drill a hole and you put the carbon dioxide, so that's this little red and blue dots here in this left-hand diagram. We can pump it and store it under high pressure in an aquifer all the way down somewhere in underground. The second option would be to do a similar thing, but now we transport this out into an ocean sequestration platform and we pump that CO2 down into the deep dark depths of the ocean. Logistically, the drilling of a pipe on the left-hand diagram here is fairly easy. We mine, we've got very deep mines, we drill oil out the ground, so that one's fairly easy. The same thing in the ocean, we drill oil from far down below. A lot of you are gonna ask, what about the bubbles that are now going to escape through the side here? Is it always going to stay at the bottom here? So that's why I say this would be a half hour discussion if you were, you were with me. On the right hand side, we've got the same thing. We've got CO2 that's being emitted. We've got various sources, we can collect these. And now the second option or other options are, we already have existing systems where we remove oil out of the ground. A lot of these oil wells are depleted. So here we've got depleted oil and gas reservoirs. Once that oil has now been taken up, we can now put CO2 down into these depleted oil wells. There has been discussion as well that this could be advantageous because you're pumping in CO2 at pressure, which is going to help push out this oil so that we can now, it will help take out the oil. I'm sure all of you have heard about the fracking issues and all sorts of issues like this. The, the pros and cons of fracking have been, or maybe not in a similar way, not as um, controversial, I suppose, but some of the negative aspects of fracking also come out from here. So you're pumping gases into voids in the soil. What happens when they come out? Will they always stay out? What are the implications of putting gas in in this aquifer? So this is also an aquifer here. So I'm trying to multitask while I'm talking. So this here, these dots are also the gas that you would then put into, into this area here. Will it stay here or will it not? Okay, as I say, go and read Dickinson to see what they say about this. So the same thing here we say we've already got oil production wells so this is the same thing on a different diagram we've already got these oil wells we can take the CO2 so this is geological sequestration we can then pump it deep down into the depths of the earth and we can have CO2 in here so we've already seen that on in one day Sydney had that really big bubble on a previous slide how can we now will we find the volumes to store the carbon dioxide that we need to take out of the atmosphere. Remember, all of this is now under pressure. So that was atmospheric pressure that you saw in the previous diagram. This is now under high pressure. So PVNRT, it, we've reduced, we've increased the pressure. So the volume is much reduced. So if we're looking at CO2 capture in specifically in terms of a coal-fired power plant, that should be a C up there, not a subscript. I've given you a diagram here of how it might happen in a coal-fired power plant. So remember, we had a lot of CO2 being emitted. So this first part here, let's just look at that and I'll let you look at the rest of it. Here is one aspect of a power plant. We have the fuel in the air. We have flue gas coming out. The air emissions, sorry, are N2O2 CO2. If this is the problem that's being emitted out into the atmosphere, 
let's separate the CO2 right now so that we have a CO2 separate at the source of the problem. So obviously you'll never get 100% proper separation, but if we can separate this right at the power plant, we can then send it to some form of compression, transport and storage before we need to worry about taking it out the atmosphere. There are a lot of challenges with this though. So it's not as simple as, and I'm sure you can think, you're already telling me that this is never gonna work or this is this has, you can think of a lot of problems. So we are well aware of these problems. So firstly, that a large, a single large power plant can generate up to eight megatons of CO2 per year. If you do the maths, the PVNRT, what sort of volume are you gonna need to store this? So it is a large amount of CO2 that you need to take out of, out of the air. However, it could have, a power plant with carbon capture and storage could have 80 to 85 percent fewer CO2 emissions. So sorry, this is not a challenge. This is just a statement that you can actually get something out of it. But how do you actually get all of that eight megatons out of, of your plant? Most of our power plants, not just us in South Africa, but everywhere else, have been around for quite a while. So retrofitting some sort of capture technology onto that is not only going to be costly, it is also going to be difficult but it, there are also estimates that it can reduce the efficiency by up to 12%. So adding this on, we are trying to find ways to improve the efficiency. Improving the efficiency is going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but we are now reducing the efficiency. So in, in us trying to capture carbon, we are emitting more carbon dioxide. Depending on where you're doing this, so you saw that diagram was in the sea, transport can be a big challenge. How are you going to get from Mpumalanga or wherever it is in South Africa onto a tanker. Are you gonna do a tanker, send it down to Durban, send it onto a ship to where? So transport is a big thing. You could do it by pipeline, but then we need that infrastructure of the pipeline as well. At high pressures, at high volumes, so eight megatons of CO2 per annum. So transport is not a simple system of let's just do it. Injection itself, so we've said we already know how to drill a a bore down into the depths of the earth. The boring is not that difficult, but how do we now manage in, on an engineering side to get that high pressure, high volume gas pressurized and injected into the middle of the earth or into the ocean? It's not a simple system. The other problem is that the carbon capture technologies on coal-based utilities have not yet been proven. So there isn't a system that I'm aware of, and maybe there is one that's come out in the last few years that has actually shown this is how we do it on a coal-based system. Okay, so if we step back, if we step back and look at all of these clean technologies that we've been looking at so far, these all face some technological hurdle of some sort. If we can overcome these, we'll obviously reduce, we'll lower the costs and make them more competitive. So in the last few years, the amount of money that's been spent on this has increased, but from about the 1970s, it was a little bit flat. If we look at global numbers, the global expenditure is roughly 15 to 20 billion on trying to get some one or more of these technologies to actually be implemented effective and co cost effective rather so that we can actually tr start using some of these technologies. If we look at the technological change and environment, this process of changing can include three steps. So firstly, we need to have this invention. We have to have the idea in front of us. How are we going to actually get this going? Can we get that into innovation? So commercialization of the idea out there to the environment, oh, not out there to the people, out there to actually work. And then the last one is the diffusion of the, uh, the adaption of it. So one person can come up with a brilliant idea we need to get that brilliant idea onto a commercial scale, but even once it's on that scale, we need to actually get it to be adapted and to be used. A lot of these technologies that we've spoken about today, not all of them, but definitely the latter ones of them, haven't got all the way through to be, to be used. This technolo technological change can also come with a lot of uncertainty. So we've got a lot of ideas, a lot of things that you and I can think of, but can this idea in my head come out into research? Will the research be successful? And what do we do with that? A lot of people put money into patents that are worth billions of dollars that have no, no realization. So we need to find a way of getting a diverse strategy so that we can get these clean technologies um, 
going. The example here, or a further example, is this picking winners point at the bottom here. It can be costly. So if we think about this in the 1970s, the idea of sin fuels, so sasol and sin fuels, synthetic fuels, was seen as the big winner. It was going to be the next best thing. Unfortunately, it can be costly if you pick the wrong thing. So sin fuels in the 1970s was very good and very big in the 1970s, but it's seen now as not, not the ideal way of going about getting a clean energy. One of the problems with technological change, so we're talking about trying to implement cleaner technologies or retrofitting or any of these things, is that that technological change, when we include it with the environment, is often complicated. So it's not a matter of simply taking a technology, producing it, and it'll be better for the environment. There is going to be external factors. So even if the R&D markets function perfectly, and as we say there, they don't, it's not always possible for firms to simply do what we what is best. It's going to cost money, it's going to have external pressures, shareholders might not be on board. So if there is no incentive to do what is right for the environment or to reduce pollution, not all companies will automatically spend that extra money to do these types of things. It can also be that, particularly in difficult times like COVID, if there's going to be pressure on your company to perform, to start looking at potentially risky new additions, a further failure in the market for one company could affect other companies from looking at doing a similar technology or adapting either that similar technology or different technologies to do the same good in the future. So if we are having patents, so we said on the previous slide that people spend billions on patents to protect their their knowledge. If they have now patented their technology and they are successful, it's not going to be possible for others to do it. So for others to do it, they're going to take have to take all of the risks and start looking at how can we also improve our process or how can we, if they are being environmentally conscious, how can we improve our environmental standing? So if we could get that knowledge into the public, that's that statement, public is a knowledge good, is is Knowledge is a public good. If we can share that knowledge, we can then hopefully build on each other and and get these things out for the betterment of everyone. Okay, so I think I've spoken to some of the slide already. So we're talking about if we have a patent for an, a, a something, so if it's a way of reducing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if you've got a patent, it limits the amount of sharing that you can do, or not sharing, that the amount Others can't use your knowledge because it's now patented, so it slows down the process of innovation. So I've said some of this already. I'll let you read through this again. There are ways to incentivize the research into alternative and cleaner energies, and one way of that is through tax credits. So tax credits can lower the cost of R&D for firms, so giving them more money to do various projects to look into ways of ensuring a cleaner environment or cleaner energy for, for that. As I already kind of mentioned, if the government is giving tax credits for certain things, firms can still choose what to do. So they will do the most profitable projects first. So they are unlikely to stimulate basic research, but they could be used for other things that are going to be more profitable for the company and help to increase or not, sorry, help to keep the shareholders happy, but not necessarily improve the situation for the environment. One way to get the sorry, one way to get the commercialization of these cleaner energy options is by government funding. So the government can provide research funding to firms and universities who can perform research, or the government can perform this research itself in order to get these type of things. In 2007, as an example, the U.S. government provided 112 billion federal R&D funding which they split over government, research agencies, industry, universities, or nonprofits to look at ways of getting cleaner energy into the commercial sphere. Instead of looking at alternative energy means to reduce the carbon dioxide that's emitted into the environment, there are a couple of other ways that we can also increase the energy efficiency of systems. So these might be things like investment subsidies, so you can have subsidies for things that are more energy efficient, 
product labeling, so an energy star labeling as an example. Some computer screens used to have it. I recall there was a sticker on the bottom that said this is an energy star product. So consumers can look and buy the one that is more energy efficient to hopefully deal with CO2 emissions in an indirect way. There can also be product standards, so a product efficiency standard, so it forces consumers to make choices which we are not currently making. We could also have projects that improve energy efficiencies that are certified, so it's a white certificate. So there is a minimum investment required. Sorry, an addition, sorry, another option is to have investments in energy efficiency companies. We could also have various utility regulations. So because we operate in regulated markets, there's little incentive to encourage efficiencies. But one way to do this is to decouple sales and profits so we can look at various other things. So I'll let you read some of the slides from here on until the end on your own a bit. But basically what we're trying to say is that if firms are only caring about their own private returns, there's little that's going to be done for, well, let me just put the marker on here. So the little is going to be done in terms of development or investment into alternative forms of energy, particularly cleaner energy, if they are going to be worrying about their private returns, their own private money and not the, the impacts of society at large, unless there are some other forces that are at play. There are other sort of incomplete information that we might get. There is uncertainty around R&D for, for a lot of companies. So it's difficult. So if there's that uncertainty, it's difficult to raise the capital to invest in projects where there is such an uncertainty in the information or an incomplete lack, not a, well, a lack of information. So the other problem with adopting some of the new technologies is that the market could fail. So as more people use the technology, others can learn about it and you can get one person using it and called an epidemic effect. You, you start learning from the others and the process or the information that we, we have from the, the process can get spread across so that more people can, can start, start using or taking up the technologies. So that in effect is also learning by doing and learning by using. So this is not just true for cleaner energy. So as we start to learn how to do things and learning from others how to do it, the build up and the promotion of these sorts of technologies will become more, more and more possible. One of the problems though, or the failures, so sorry, some of these aren't necessarily failures. We have a potential problem of lock-in. So this is a, a possible problem that, go well, it is a problem, not a possible. It's a problem with more things than just alternative energy types. So sometimes switching to new technologies can be very expensive. So the example here could be that, let's just think of video games or things like that. So Xbox versus PlayStation. If you've bought yourself an Xbox and you've been spending all those years buying different games on one type of console, to now switch across to another is not only expensive in terms of buying the new piece of equipment, buying the Xbox or the PlayStation, you now buy all the little games that come with it. So in a similar way, we've got this with, we are locked into certain technologies. This time, it's not necessarily a game console that we're talking about. This is a whole chemical plant. So if you already have something to treat coal, something that's large, we might be locked into that. So switching to a new technology can be very expensive. So it's not simply just, oh, we'll just one day change one type to the other. It takes time, money, and a lot of effort. The other thing that we could look at is policy options for environmental markets. So we have ways of convincing people that they need to switch over to, to different alternative or cleaner energy rather. So I keep on using the word alternative, we should be using cleaner. So to switch over to a cleaner market, there are different ways of doing it and policy options are one of them. So we have renewable energy targets, we can have feed-in tariffs. So if you have a solar system or a wind system, you can get tariffs to help you with that or some sort of tariff to sort of help you with that on a policy side of it. There could also be renewable energy certificates, so to prove that you have complied with certain things, or there could just be subsidies. So if you're investing into a cleaner energy type scenario, what sort of investment subsidy can you get from that? So those policy options as well, and I think this is my last slide for, for this section, but the simulation suggests that the largest efficiency gains come from the policies and not the R and sorry, environmental policies and not R and D policies. So if we want those gains, we need to come up with some targets, some policies on an environmental side. So push the environmental side rather than promoting the R and D to actually build 
the alternative energy sites. These policies, those environmental policies, can help encourage the research as well. So those alternative technologies, cleaner energy, but they might not, they, sorry, they might not, they do not encourage diffusion. So there's still going to be the problem of, even though we have this technology and a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today, we have that technology, how do we actually implement it and how do we get people to buy into these sorts, such of things? The problem though, however, the, these policies, they, that include the taxes and the subsidies can encourage the use of technologies closest to the market. So there are ways that we can, can get this. For this week, I will give you the TUT. Um, so again, sorry, let's start that again. I will, you, in the TUT, you will see that I've not asked you again any sort of number questions. So in the assignment, the test and the exams, I won't ask you to calculate a number question. Everything that you've done in here and the things that you are learning in the Wikipedia pages about clean carbon, clean carbon, carbon capture and storage, IGCC, I will ask you about the theory behind it. Well, not the theory, sort of how does it work? What is the logic? What are the pros and cons sort of in your mind? So I'm not going to ask you any mathematical questions. Again, unfortunately, this section isn't covered in the textbook. I think this is probably the last week that we'll have for a while rather that is not covered in the textbook. Next week, we'll come back to the textbook. So please just make sure that you go over these notes or any of the links that I've got in this page. The TUT as well, please make sure you cover that. The discussion page is still open, so please make sure you go and ask if you have any queries for that. Otherwise, I will open up the Teams meeting so that we can have a consultation on Friday. So you can, please don't wait until Friday. Again, please ask me in the, in the um, discussion, but Friday we will have our usual discussion. So you can come and ask any of your queries then. Thanks.